Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, this is Tom Banke with Forward Community Investments, and we're excited to have you join, uh, join us for today's presentation. Um, first, I'd like to go through some housekeeping notes on how we uh, would like participants to uh, partake in this webinar. Um, first, you can join the webinar by using the telephone number provided um, in this slide. Uh, you can take a look at that. Um, you can also use your computer speakers, uh, select your choice in the webinar pane. Um, also, we will take your questions during the webinar. If you have a question, please submit it by using the chat function, which can be found in the window to the right side of your screen. Uh, for the poll, um, who are you? We answer the poll uh, regarding your position in the organization, then use the chat feature to enter your name and organization. Okay, looks like we have about 40% uh, executive directors, uh, about 15% board members, 39% uh, staff, and uh, some others. Okay, um, so um, like I said, this is Tom Banke with Forward Community Investments, and we're excited for us uh, for you to join our presentation. Uh, before we get going, I'd like to take this opportunity to share the background of how we got here today. Forward Community Investments has worked with Wisconsin nonprofits for almost 20 years. We build capacity in nonprofits through low-cost loans and expert advisory services. As the most established financial management advisor of its kind in Wisconsin, Forward Community Investments provides its clients with guidance, resources, skills, and capacity building as a means of building strong, secure, and sustainable communities one nonprofit at a time. Wisconsin's nonprofits are faced with many complex problems today. Based on Forward Community Investments 2012 survey of the nonprofit sector across Wisconsin, 58% reported expenses increasing, while only 37% reported revenue increases. It's a fragile financial cycle that has been challenging for most, making strategic leadership, efficient use of financing, finances ever more important. Well, the good news is that with the support of BMO Harris Bank, Forward Community Investments is offering a series of webinars to augment the Building Financial Sustainability, a virtual leadership series, and to further build nonprofit effectiveness. A year ago, BMO Harris and M&I came together to form BMO Harris Bank, a strong U.S. bank that offers more for the customers and communities it serves. BMO Harris Bank is an active partner in Wisconsin communities and demonstrates strong corporate citizenship as an important part of whom they are and, who they are and how they approach the community. We thank BMO Harris for their support to provide Building Financial Sustainability, a virtual leadership series for, Wisconsin, for Wisconsin's nonprofit community. Today's topic is strategy development. Is your organization built to last? Co-presented by Dennis Johnson of Forward Community Investments, Mary Stella Tello of Vista Global Coaching and Consulting, and Ben Williams of Forward Community Investments. Nonprofit strategy is built upon an organization's self-awareness, competitive, and business model. Unlike traditional strategic planning, which is often approached as a once every three years activity, strategic decision making is best accomplished by building tools that can be applied on an ongoing basis. This webinar will help you understand the strategic decision-making applications for nonprofits, discover the value of proactive and continuous strategy development, see how your organization's business model affects your strategy, and access the tools to build your organization's strategic thinking. Our presenters for today's presentation are Dennis Johnson, He's the Vice President of Advisory Services for Forward Community Investments. Dennis joined FCI in 2010 as Vice President of Advisory Services after spending the last 20 years in the financial service industry. He has significant experience in leadership development, engagement, individual and organizational learning, team building, negotiation and conflict management, presentation skills, communication techniques, workforce development and managing diversity. Dennis is a professional coach, a certified governance trainer with BoardSource, and a certified practitioner with the Leadership Circle. 
Mary Stellatello, who is the principal and founder of Vista Global Coaching and Consulting, she served as the she serves as the strategic advisor to FCI's advisory services. She has more than 20 years of experience in the nonprofit and philanthropic sector and is a certified executive coach. She spent her career as an executive director of several different children and youth serving organizations, including legal services for children in the foster care system, services for runaway and homeless youth, child care and family support services for homeless family. Mary started Vista Global in 2010 with executive coaching and has included consulting after spending about five years as a senior associate with Tatiana Consulting in California. This global coaching and consulting provides services in the areas of leadership development, training, facilitation, board development, organizational capacity building, and strategy development. Mary serves as the board chair of Amigos de las Americanas, an international youth leadership organization. Our last presenter is Ben Williams, who is the Director of Advisory Services with Forward Community Investments. Ben joined Forward Community Investments after uh, spending several years in Chicago as a management consultant working on strategy, marketing, and operations management projects with a focus on organizational growth and change. Ben recently completed his master's degree at the La Follette School of Public Affairs within the University of Wisconsin, focusing on nonprofit organizations. Right now, at this time, I'd like to turn the call over to Dennis Johnson. Thanks, Tom, and thanks for those introductions. Here's what we have planned for today's presentation. By the end of today's learning, everyone should have an understanding of the strategic decision-making applications for nonprofits. In a time when there's so much uncertainty in the sector, it's key to be strategic each and every day. Along those lines, we will share and help everyone discover the value of proactive and continuous strategy development. The key words here are proactive and continuous. We're going to help everyone better understand how their organization's business model affects strategy development. And last, we're going to provide access to some tools to help build your organization's strategic thinking. Now Ben's going to take us through some context around organizational life cycles as we begin to frame the strategy conversation. Great. Thank you, Dennis. The context of your organization's situation, its life cycle stage, can define the types of challenges and opportunities your strategy will be focused on. So I want to first provide a brief overview of some characteristics of each of these life cycles. And once the, the series um, is over, we'll be sending a follow-up with some extra material on, on this very topic. The idea and invention stage is really when the program first begins to emerge, with usually with a visionary leader, an executive director is the only staff member, the board is oftentimes hand-picked, Systems are of very little concern. Fund development is on the emotions and potential of the organization to serve the community and have an impact. The startup phase is when you see those programs become a little bit more formalized. There's some hierarchy in the management, but it's really a sense of family that prevails amongst the staff. The board is small and collegial. The administrative systems are starting to become formalized. The organization is still really dependent on a few funding sources and external relationships. The adolescent stage, newer programs, secondary programs, are starting to emerge. A strategic division of labor would begin. The executive director role would become more specialized. Administrative staff are hired. Functions are brought in-house. The board starts to focus on expanding and diversifying, while the organization still remains slightly undercapitalized, which could constrain its growth, but it's starting to begin to grow into that, into that full organizational size. A mature organization would be one where the programs are well established, succession planning becomes an issue that emerges, management roles start to become more and more formalized and emerge. The board is strongly focused on the sustainability of the organization over the long term, with administrative functions clearly formalized and a cash reserve policy needing to be built. Finally, the review and renew period is when programs may begin to stagnate or the founder may leave. And there may be a need for a new staff structure, or the board may lose some engagement, and the administrative systems require retooling. The fund development may be hitting a plateau, and change is necessary for the program to continue moving forward. So we'd like to open up another poll for you to ask what life cycle stage best fits your organization. So that should be launching now.
Thank you for, the, I, I believe there may have been a challenge with that poll, so I'll, I'll move forward to the next slide. In terms of the capacity building, this is an, another important concept it's to provide context to the strategy that we're providing. We define capacity building as the intentional, coordinated, and mission-driven efforts aimed at strengthening the management and governance of a nonprofit to improve their performance and impact. The three words, intentional, coordinated, and mission-driven, are underlined because those are our key. Intentional, capacity building doesn't happen by chance. It needs to be something that's designed, prioritized, and, and, and really set forth in the organization's planning. Coordinated, you need to take a systems approach to capacity building. If you start strengthening only one area of the organization without addressing the other areas, there'll become more and more gaps. Lastly, mission-driven. The goal of capacity building is to improve your mission. If it isn't focused on activities that will improve your ability to reach that impact goal, then, then, it, then it's not in the right place. Some of the common causes and reasons for building capacity in organizations are listed on the screen. Increasingly, we found a trend of, of greater competition, and we'll talk about this later, but both for resources, for staff, for funding, for borders. And in this environment, the stronger organizations that have high capacity will be the ones to succeed. Environments are also becoming increasingly complex with new funding requirements focused on outcomes, new challenges to, to react to, and, and changes becoming the norm for nonprofits. And it's critical that they have the capacity to adjust and, and be reflective of those changes that are occurring in their communities. Lastly, and this is a trend that's been increasing both from funders and from the public, is an escalating scrutiny to demonstrate not just that we're good people doing good things, but what exactly is coming of those efforts that we're providing and really showing and demonstrating that effectiveness and profits are This graphic represents the relationships between the nine elements of forward community investments capacity assessment tool. And this kind of illustrates all of the different areas of an organization that drive its ability to be effective. You'll see at the top the element mission vision strategy is highlighted and underlined. We feel this is the most important because it's the driver and foundation of so many other areas of the organization. For example, we couldn't do effective fundraising if we don't know our purpose, have a clear vision or sense of the impact we wish to have, and we can't do effective public relations, fundraising or recruitment, if we don't have a sense of our strategic priorities. Again, what are those most important things for our organization over the next five years? And that's why this is such a key component and has the arrow driving down. Another very important element is the service delivery and impact. This is the clearest expression of what is important to us, what we do, the programs and services that we are offering, and, and how we reach it. So it's not just about counting the numbers of people that are in the room, but what's the quality of their lives that are changing due to the work that we've been providing them. So program development, delivery, and impact, along with those mission, vision, and strategy are truly some of the most critical. You'll notice that the executive staff leadership and governance are kind of in the outside in that large oval, and that's because these are really the glue of what holds an organization together. You can have a great mission and good programs, but without strong leadership from the executive staff area and from the board, it's just not going to work. Leadership is just so fundamental. These great leaders are so important, and this expresses the centrality of it by having it outside of those buckets. The five elements below in this section, the management and development of human resources, strategic relationships, financial legal management, operations, and revenue and resource department are also important. But these are the supporting building blocks that enable our, our, us to use our programs to reach the mission. And so these are important, and without them, you wouldn't be able to reach the mission vision as you seek. But in terms of the scope of things, the mission vision strategy and service delivery tend to be the most critical. So just to elaborate a little bit more on the vision, mission, and values. Values are, are really the, the organizational sense of self that really kind of aligns with the mission and vision to say, how are we working together? The vision 
is the optimal impact for what do we wish to change. In 10 years from now, what will we see that's different? The mission is, from the vision, a little bit closer and focused onto what are we doing and for whom are we doing it. And again, those core values are the building blocks for what are we doing together as an organization. So I'm going to pass the presentation over to Mary, who will begin talking about strategic planning and some of the new updates and trends in it. Thanks so much, Ben. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here today. Um, just wanted to start with um, that last piece that Ben said about um, mission, vision, and values really being the bedrock of your foundation and starting to think strategically. And um, I, as mentioned in the introduction, I was um, a consultant with La Piana Consulting, and I arrived at the firm just as they were in the final months of uh, doing research to pull together the nonprofit strategy revolution, real-time strategic planning. And so I had an opportunity to uh, contribute to the development of some of the tools in this book, and actually um, we'll be sharing some of those tools with you um, after the webinar today. So why did we do this research um, at La Piana? Really, it was through the experience of hundreds of nonprofits that had been complaining about the time and money and effort put into strategic planning and feeling uh, very unsatisfied with those results, as well as funders that were also feeling frustrated about approach, you know, the approach to strategic planning and hoping for something new. So um, with that, we undertook several years of research working with organizations to help uh, develop a new approach to strategic planning. Now, not to say that um, any, you know, any approach is better or uh, worse than another, but this was just a new way of looking at strategy. And um, with respect to oftentimes the framework used for strategic, strategic planning, we often focus on goals rather than strategy formation. And so you can get great goals, but they may not uh, relate to each other. So they, um, this approach is something that really looks at integrating your uh, strategic thinking and building on that strategic thinking. So what we've seen, you know, oftentimes in some of the feedback we got from clients was that um, planning is not strategy. Um, and you would often get a plan, which was really more of an operational plan, and that what we were really looking at is trying to build the strategic thinking and acting skills of organizations to, to respond to the changing environment that Ben had mentioned earlier. So why do you need to think strategically? Well, as you may know, over the, <laughs> over the last few years, uh, things have been quite different in the environment that we operate in. Uh, there may be bigger fish, smaller fish, or no fish based on what's happened in the economy and uh, with demographics and funding. Um, so thinking strategically is something that you, we all need to be doing on a regular basis, not just every three years. What we also heard from our clients in this research was that <laughs> this was a result. Sometimes people would experience uh, a lot, uh, you know, a, a process that ended with a gigantic tome of papers, um, but not something that was usable. And real-time strategic planning really tries to address some of these drawbacks of traditional strategic planning. It's, uh, the time often used for this process is about six months. Um, it is a periodic uh, it's periodic in nature in the sense that, I'm sorry, it's not periodic in nature like uh, regular strategic planning, which often happens once every three years or once every five years, but it's really an ongoing process. And we'll share some of the tools that um, you would use in an ongoing process to think strategically. In addition, um, real-time strategic planning really works in partnership with looking at organizational capacity. And we look at strategy at three different levels of the organization. Um, not just looking at goals and objectives, but looking at the relationship between strategy at your organizational, your programmatic, and your operational levels. So as a result, 
you really, uh, organizations start to think more strategically. Um, they look at having a sound business model. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, organizations are, have a greater uh, awareness of the market and what's happening or in uh, the space that they operate in. And they also really uh, focus on leveraging their competitive advantage, which um, is also known as your unique strengths. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this process really focuses on building organizations as learning organizations to be able to be responsive and nimble to the changing environment that you work in. So through this, um, this reach research, we identified a definition for strategy. And it's interesting to see that this element of coordination um, is also related to the work that FCI was doing. That's why our partnership has been so successful, is that we really see this coordinated set of, of efforts um, as a key component to success in building your capacity as an organization. So strategy is looking at this coordinated set of actions designed to create and sustain a competitive advantage in achieving your mission. Your competitive advantage is your unique strengths, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So as I mentioned, um, the real-time strategic planning process looks at a strategy pyramid at three different levels. And for the work um, focusing on strategy development, we often, uh, in the consulting process with organizations, we actually spend the majority of time really looking at the organizational level. And that is um, focuses on your mission and vision and views um, and what is the appropriate direction be moving in to leverage your mission and your vision. So if you don't have your mission and vision um, clearly defined, that's really the place to start. And sometimes when working with organizations, we, uh, we start to move into a strategy development process, and it turns out that they do need to revisit their mission and vision because as they start to really think towards their future, they realize that they're not in alignment. At the programmatic level, um, programmatic strategies are really intended to increase your programmatic impact. So the difference with strate uh, traditional strategic planning is recognizing that there are choices that you can make about programs, that, neither, that uh, your programs are neither given nor set in stone, and that really the, the question here is looking at programmatic strategies is what is the best way to carry out your mission? Are we delivering the correct programs? Should we be doing different types of programs or should we have someone else do the programs that we're doing right now? And, fi and finally, at the operational level, really is that bedrock for the organization uh, looking at systems and policies and HR, a lot of the elements that were mentioned in the capacity building assessment that FCI does. And this is really the broad base of support um, that allows you to do uh, your work at the programmatic and the organization organizational level. Operationally, um, this level often where managers spend most of their time. Um, but again, in looking at this at an approach um, from the strategy perspective, you see how these three levels can integrate um, and interrelate to each other. So quickly, what are the principles for building strategy? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, strategy is not planning. Strategy is really about developing the direction that you're headed in, and then planning brings that strategy to life. So first you need to think about strategy, then you move into planning. Know thyself. Whether you're as individuals or as organizations, we sometimes forget who we are. For individuals, that mean, may mean that you check in with a friend or a family member, and that can bring you back to your fundamental self. Well, for organizations, what that means is taking time with your board and staff to really review the core elements of your organization's basic identity. What are those? One, of course, your mission. Two, your geography, meaning where do you work? Three, who do you serve, your customers or clients? Um, in this approach, we use the word customer to um, define all of those um, constituents that different types of organizations uh, serve. 
Uh, four, looking at your programs. What do you actually do or provide your services? And then the last element of your organizational identity is your funding. How do you pay for the, for the programs or the services that you deliver? So these key questions may seem simple and straightforward, but they're really the precursor to uh, developing strategy. And you need to answer those first and identify your um, current business model before you can move on to where do we want to go. The second element of uh, principle in developing strategy is knowing your market. Um, and that means you, not only knowing yourself, but you need to know the world around you in the larger context. And what, how will that, wa that world around you um, impact how you deliver your services, how you move forward in the future? So, you know, what kind of things are happening uh, in the socially, in the social uh, sector, or in the economic uh, trends? demographically as far as the individuals that you serve and as well as what's changing in your environment um, in your communities. Um, politically, are there things happening that you need to pay attention to? So really taking the time to truly explore and understand those changes and their implications can help you better identify future opportunities as well as challenges for your organization. Knowing your market also means knowing who else is in the space that you work in, your competitors, the other organizations that may offer uh, services that are similar to yours. Their perspectives and understanding what they do well um, and how you differentiate from them is an important element to, to building uh, strategies for success. Building on your strengths. Uh, it's human nature often to, for us to focus on our weaknesses and try to improve those. But as individuals, we're more energized and as organizations, we're more successful if we focus on our strengths. So the best approach to, to developing strategy is not only being aware of your organi organizational identity, as I mentioned, geography, customers, programs, and funding, but as well as identifying what you do best and leveraging what you do best, your particular strengths, in developing strategy for a future direction. And how you do that, you want to be able to differentiate yourself from others that are in the market that you operate in. The last piece of the principles of strategy development is making your decision-making criteria explicit. And Ben will talk about this a little bit in further detail um, further on in the, in the webinar. But strategies are about making choices. Uh, one of the most important tools that nonprofits can use is a uh, in making st strategic decisions is a strategy screen. And a strategy screen is a list of criteria against which you test various strategic options. Some of those criteria are um, pretty common across all organizations, wanting to make sure it's with uh, uh, strategies within alignment with your mission, as well as leveraging your competitive advantage or unique strengths. But other um, strategic uh, criteria will depend on your particular organization. And you go through a process to actually identify that criteria before you look at developing strategies so that you're not form-fitting a strategy um, into a desired uh, approach, but they really have thought about those questions ahead of time and it helps you as an organization to be more um, <clears throat> explicit in making decisions and really creates an opportunity for having a discussion about that. So now I'm going to turn this over to Dennis and he's going to go through the uh, strategic planning, real-time strategic planning cycle. Great, thanks Mary. So now that we've had a good understanding of some of the principles that Mary was just sharing, we're going to share and move into the, the model here, or the, um, the real-time strategic planning cycle. So here's the model. Um, you can see there's a graphical kind of uh, illustration here, but it starts a lot with some of those principles that Mary was talking about. On the kind of, if you think of this from a clock, and you go from maybe 12 to 3, 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we're really trying to answer the question of who are we? By looking at our business model, by having a greater sense of what's going on in the marketplace, and, and um, raising our awareness, 
and really identifying what is our competitive advantage, which we're going to talk a little bit about here shortly. And then as we move through the model, we start asking those questions and answering them, you know, where are we? How did we get here? And that refers to some of the strategy screen questions to really start looking at, you know, how do we filter through the opportunities that are presented for us? We move through the cycle then and start to go, well, where are we going into the future? And that's when we start to develop these, what we refer to or what the model refers to as big questions. And once you have those big questions identified and you do some refinement, you want to start to then de to develop and test the potential strategies to determine how well they're going to work for your particular organization. So how do we get kind of that, that last question that we're really trying to ask? That's where implementation and planning really starts to come in and, and that how do we take the strategic options and really make them actionable. So the first step in that model was on the current business model. So before we can determine where we're heading, we need to have a clear understanding of where we are right now. In the actual process, the strategic thinking begins even before everyone comes together during a full day session when we facilitate these. But the organization really needs to So business model here, so what we're really talking about here when we say business model, we're talking about the business model with our clients. We're pushing at the kind of the who's, the what's, the how's, and how it's financed. So who are you? Where, you know, what is your mission? What is your brand? What do you do? Things like you know, geography. Where are you serving? What types of activities or programming are you delivering? Mary talked about earlier about customers, but who are you serving? How you do it is the operational mile. That's the actual getting the work done. Then the last piece, and quite honestly one of the most critical ones, is how is it getting financed and evaluating your financial um, model so that you can identify both sources and also the distribution of your funding. So here's a, uh, kind of one of the worksheets, and this is one of the pieces that we are going to be sharing with you, one of the frameworks, one of the tools, is really to start looking at you know, the geography, the customers, your programs, and funding. And quite oftentimes when we work with clients, it's, really, it's oftentimes more important to really identify who you're not serving, what customers you're not serving, or where you're not geographically working, what programs you're not offering, or perhaps where funding is not coming from, to really identify, can we be expanding it? Should it be contracting? What's kind of going on there? There may be discussion around what the priority areas are. As the customers are related, you know, oftentimes here we're trying to really help clients define, you know, who are their customers? Who are their primary clients or constituents? This can sometimes be real expansive, and so oftentimes we support um, organizations and really trying to help them identify who are the primary customers, who are their secondary or who are their tertiary customers. So because really to be most strategic, you need to be clear about which customers are most important to the organization. In that programming section, there are many parts you want to be doing best. And then obviously funding again is, you know, where is the funding coming from? So the next step in the model is step B, and that's really where we're starting to look at market awareness and competitive advantage. So market awareness is really here where you know, we're really starting to look and talk about trends, um, the forces, whether they're social or economic or political, that have created your current position. Your position is really the market and your current place in it and how you got here. Competition, sometimes, you know, oftentimes we work with clients and they think, well, we don't really compete. We're collaborators in the sector. But quite honestly, we are all competing for different types of resources and really knowing who else is in the marketplace, what strengths they have and what non-strengths they have in comparison to your own organization. So the next slide here is really talking about those trends. Oftentimes you may be familiar with a SWOT analysis, but trends is really a little bit different. It's how is the market changing? And this is one handout that really kind of helps to look at, start thinking about that. So again, what are the social things that are happening in, the, in your marketplace? What are the economic trends? Most organizations across the state of Wisconsin have had some um, ripple effect from the economy. Um, demographic trends. We tend to see, you know, what's happening with both your clients and, and what's happening from demographics from the agencies that perhaps you're serving. Fund probably shifting for most everyone these days, whether you're getting funding from government, whether you're getting it from um, corporate or family foundations or individual donors. Policy and politics kind of go hand in hand. There's um, obviously some changes that are happening there on a national back if you're um, impacted by the sequestration. It could be on the state level. It could be on the local level as well. And then obviously we probably have all seen that how technology has really changed and impacted our organizations over the last five to ten years. So here we're going to do, I believe, a poll next uh, to really kind of find out what trends are, in, are uh, impacting your organization most. Are they economic changes? Are they demographic? Are they funding? 
Is it policy or political changes? Or is it technology? So we're going to just take a minute here while people are uh, entering their uh, responses to what's really impacting their organizations the most. And we've got some folks uh, loading in here right now. It looks like the majority, well, shifting a little bit, but uh, funding changes is probably one that is, that is on the top of minds of most people. And perhaps maybe where those funding changes are coming might be directly related to policy or political changes in addition to economic changes. So I think we're going to close the poll here. And it shows that about half of the uh, folks that responded really identified that funding changes were the top um, trend that was really impacting their organization. And hopefully you can see that now. So 40% economic, 26% demographic, 47% funding changes, 30% policy or political, and 9% technology changes. So I guess that's um, pretty in, in lockstep with what we see with our clients that we work with across the state. So Mary's going to walk us through a little bit around nonprofit competition. And so I'm going to turn it back to Mary. Thanks, Dennis. Well, I think the, um, the trend related to funding um, is probably the easiest way for, for us to think about competition uh, in, in the sector. But there's, there are many other ways that we compete as organizations. And I, you know, as Dennis mentioned, sometimes it's uncomfortable for us to talk about um, other organizations in the sector as competitors um, because we really uh, try to foster collaboration. However, but um, in fact, you can compete and collaborate with the same organization. And we talk about competitors um, in this model because it really helps us lead to the ultimate kind of core piece of the model, which is the comp your competitive advantage. So we want to go through a, a process to really understand your competitors and what sets you apart from them so that you're able to identify your competitive advantage and what makes you unique. So what do we compete for? Well, certainly you can compete for uh, constituents or um, individuals that use your services. We compete for human capital, you know, people that uh, run your programs, your board, your staff, volunteers. Um, people have to make choices in where they want to work or where they want to volunteer their time. And then certainly um, related to time and attention, it is a crowded market as far as the airspace and, and getting the attention uh, through media or through the public. Um, you know, that is a challenge for all of us. And lastly, as we mentioned uh, in this last poll, funding is certainly an area that we compete. So to kind of sharpen your focus on thinking about competitors, and we, uh, through the consulting process, we actually go through an exercise where you identify three to five competitors and really look at each of those organizations in a way and how do you compare to them. So um, one way to, to use that lens is to think about direct competitors, which are you know, oftentimes the easiest. And we use an example um, of a child care center. Well, it could be you know, kinder care versus another child care center that actually does exactly the same type of services, and you bring your children there. Um, substitutable competitors are, are slightly different. And that's it. this is an area where we really try to help our clients think about um, what are other ways that, that a constituent or a customer can have those needs or services met. So I often use the example of the arts, in that um, if you're an arts organization, so maybe you're an orchestra, well, what are other ways that um, people spend their time with entertainment? Well, they could be going to the symphony, or they could be going to the movies, or they could be going to a sporting event. So, you know, potentially those are other types of competitors that are using other services to, to achieve that same outcome. And then certainly resource competitors that we've talked about. So when we go through this exercise of looking at comp uh, competitors to identify your competitive advantage, we really want to ask this question. What is it that you admire about your competitors? And this kind of turns things on their head because as an organization, we always feel very proud about what we do and we feel that we, we do what we do best. So when we ask that question to really challenge you to say, 
what do we admire about other organizations, it really starts to help clarify your unique assets and what sets you apart. And that's your competitive advantage. So your competitive advantage is really a core element to developing strategy. Um, really see that almost as important as your mission statement, that you want to be leveraging your competitive advantage as, as well as uh, achieving your mission so that you um, are able to have the greatest impact. All right, so what is competitive advantage? It's your ability to produce social value using unique assets, outstanding, execution, or both. So a unique asset is a strength that you have as an organization. It could be program design, cultural capacity, robust funding. Execution advantages is really how you deliver what you do faster, less expensive, and better. So those are the two types of uh, competitive advantages that you want to look at. All right. I think we're going to do a poll right now. And if you're thinking about competitive advantages, and I believe we also have some questions, and we may want to stop to take a couple of those. And Here's the quick poll related to your competitive advantages. Do you use them? Well, somewhat, haven't really thought about it, or we've got a few that we leverage. So far about half of the audience has voted. We have about 10% saying yes, very well. About half saying somewhat, but not fully. A 30% saying not, not much, a few strengths are leveraged and about 7 or 8% that say, not at all, we haven't really thought about it. And that's staying consistent as more and more people have been voting in. Uh-huh, great. It's, it, it is somewhat of a new concept, at least for me, when I was um, you know, looking at strategy and thinking about um, leveraging your strengths. So um, I think that aligns well with the folks that are on the line. I'm going to turn it over to Ben to move us around the cycle here, um, looking at your strategy screen. Great, and thank you, Mary. So now as we move on through the cycle and we have clarity on who we are, the next step is really to start focusing on what is important to us to consider as we look at strategies for how we can move forward, and that's really what the strategy screen is about. A strategy screen is a set of criteria that you can use to help you identify and, and choose whether or not a particular option is consistent with your identity. The criteria that you use specifically for your organization depends on your mission, its identity, and your current market position. Oftentimes this criteria will evolve over time, but it usually contains about five to eight elements. You don't want to have too many elements where it becomes overly burdensome, and you don't want to have too few where it doesn't help really distinguish between different options. Regardless of the specific questions for your organization, it should always include a factor or question about your mission, and your competitive advantage because you really want to make sure if it isn't fitting with our mission, then is it really something we should be doing? And second, is it something that we have the ability or strengths or opportunity to, to really leverage? So as an example, we've included our strategy screen for advisory services. See how this can help us make decisions as we consider the potential opportunities for us. Our first question is, does it align with our mission, vision, and values? To what extent does it leverage our competitive advantages? To what degree are products and services revenue neutral? How does it impact our capacity? Is there a trade-off? To what extent does it leverage opportunity for additional work? And are we the right entity or should we partner? And You'll notice that the questions are framed in a way so it isn't simply a yes or no, or a, but to provide a gradation of perhaps like high, medium, low, or you know, for the finance ones, it might be, you know, short-term, medium-term, long-term. And that way you can really get a good sense of what really would be involved in each of these options. So now I'm going to pass the presentation to, to start focusing on the big questions, which is really what that strategy screen is to help you answer. Super. Thanks, Ben. So when we think about developing strategies, they are in response to strategic questions that are facing the organization. So big questions is really that opportunity or that threat to which the organization must respond. 
Usually it's beyond the scope of the organization's current strategies, thus it's requiring a new strategy. And big questions come in three forms. They come in either a new opportunity, a competitive challenge, or a business model challenge. So I just want to briefly talk about those different types. The new opportunity could be a funder request to expand a program. We had a question recently here about contracts coming in and, and um, do we want to you know, really shift our mission or do we want to be you know, taking those contracts or maybe saying no to those contracts. So that could be a new opportunity. Um, it could be a new building becomes available. Maybe we need to move. Maybe we've outgrown our space. Maybe uh, we need to be in a more um, visible space. It could be a potential merger or some type of partnership or collaboration with a new partner. Competitive challenges are really another way an organization is acting that's harmful to your organization. So it could be a new organization that maybe is arriving um, in your marketplace and offering services that are similar to you. It could be a, an existing organization that's getting a lot of coverage in the media or in publicity. Oftentimes, sometimes that we hear from organizations in a community, well, so-and-so is on a capital campaign. They're building a new building. So they're getting all of the PR and all of the media exposure. But this one is really about competitors that are um, really encroaching on your particular geography and offering similar types of programs. And then the last one there, that business model challenge, is really it's similar to the competitive challenge, except that the business model will challenge you and all of your competitors with similar program design. For example, that could be rates for services are never changing, but licensing requirements are, so it's creating some compression there. Um, that might require more administration or more staffing. Funding streams are shifting. We saw that earlier in the poll today that they're shifting for the majority of the folks that responded. So the other piece is that while funding is shifting, increasing for demand for services really is, is also increasing. And oftentimes in some of the communities that we see, those increases really can't be met. So we have a poll coming next, I believe, that really asks, you know, kind of what are some of the biggest questions that are facing your organization right now? And so while we wait for that to come through, what's that? Actually, if, if you want to post your biggest question into the chat or question box, just as, as an example, to give you some time to consider what are those things facing your organization. Thanks for that clarification, Ben. Um, and I think I, I'd put out in the chat feature earlier, anyone who's posting questions today will be entered into a drawing for a book uh, that, we, that Mary talked about earlier that really de divulges the full model in detail, the nonprofit strategy revolution. So what are the biggest questions that are facing your organization? We got one question coming in, you know, who do we serve? We had a question earlier about, you know, what contracts do we pursue? You know, how can we fund funding to continue what we're doing? Um, board structures, here's a question around, you know, is our, is our current biggest question, but how is our board really helping us to respond to all of these changes in the environment? Um, increasing competition, volunteers, um, home visit expansion options that historically had been provided within the organization. How big do we grow? How fast do we grow? Um, changing mission to adopt more easily fundable programs. That's the second time we've heard that today. Um, finding support to future, uh, to, uh, excuse me, finding funding to support our future growth. They're, they're really coming in now. So um, some great questions out there, but these are the things that, that would really help the model, help you walk through the model to try and gain some answers to. Um, so thanks for that participation there. And I think we're going to move uh, forward into uh, the next step in the model. It's really around testing and information gathering. And Ben talked earlier about using the strategy screen to really help test um, strategies as you develop them. Again, proposed strategies are just that. They're proposed. They're a strategy. They're not necessarily a goal. The difference is that strategies are interlinked actions rather than specific outcomes. So strategies can lead to the development of goals such as increased uh, revenue by X percent over X time. But those goals are really in the service of carrying out that larger strategy. So we're just seeing some questions here about how, how fast do we grow, where do we grow. Um, that's a good example there. So testing is really around beyond running the strategy through the strategy screen, you can also look at some um, asking some external stakeholders, perhaps to get their uh, perspectives on how you're thinking you're going to pursue a particular opportunity. So we kind of look at those into a couple of different areas. That could be the reality check, you know, where somebody says, is this really feasible? It could be the laughable test. If you describe that strategy to someone that knows your organization, whether that's a colleague, a funder, um, can they really see you pulling it off, or is it, is it kind of like, well, how the heck would you possibly do that? Um, could be laughable. And then the last one is really around kind of the validity test. Does it really address the big questions, or is it a good strategy, but perhaps not the right time to pursue that strategy? And so oftentimes we conduct those external interviews during this step to really 
you know, talk to interviewees, people who know the organization well, to really get their sense of how well those particular options are going to um, play out from their perspective. And then the last step here, which I mentioned earlier when we kind of looked at the overall model, is really that implementation phase. So real-time strategic planning doesn't replace that annual planning. It doesn't devalue planning. In fact, it facilitates planning because there's greater clarity concerning what the organization will and won't do. So that's creating annual work plans to implement the strategies. It's making sure that your outcomes are measurable. It's regularly scanning the environment to figure out, again, kind of what trends and changes are happening and how you can respond to those. So organizations that think and act strategically can build in regular opportunities to discuss those external environments. That could be at board meetings, that could be at staff meetings. Um, we really encourage organizations that use this model to really kind of try and identify what's going on in the community, how are you paying attention to it, what are the things that are happening that could impact us. And then lastly here, and this is also part of the financial learning series, is you know, how are you creating a dashboard to really articulate the things that are going on in your organization. So keys to success. These are kind of the wrap-up for today's call, and then um, we're going to open it up, or excuse me, take questions that have been posted through that we're going to try and answer um, that perhaps we haven't been able to so far. So here are the keys. Start with the evaluation of an organizational capacity assessment. Talked about that earlier, but really trying to identify where you are in the context of those nine organizational elements, and specifically really trying to hone in around values, excuse me, vision and mission and strategy. Thinking and acting strategically, making sure that you're adaptable to the changing environment. We've all identified the changes that are happening around us, but we really want to make sure that um, you're identifying what perhaps is changing and then how you're responding to it. Mary talked earlier about in the principle, you really want to leverage your strengths. What does your organization do really well? This can come out in the organizational capacity assessment um, in addition to the opportunities, but really trying to work and play off of those strengths first and leverage them. And then lastly, establishing the criteria to help make decision making more um, concrete and, and, and more successful. The strategy screen is a great tool. Um, we hear from time and time again organizations that we've worked with and our own from our own experience that it really helps to try and wrap everyone around how are we going to vet the opportunities and the challenges and the, um, the things that are going on and that are being presented to us. So now we have time for some questions. And we have some questions out here. We had, um, I'm going to pose this one question to Mary, I think. But the question was um, kind of getting back to mission and vision and where we are pursuing perhaps funding and, and contracts. And the question was really around um, uh, this individual, I think I'm getting the sense that I want to put words in their mouth, but you know, they find that there, perhaps maybe there's some mission creep going on and that we're, we're chasing contracts and, and funding that perhaps is not in the closest alignment with our mission. And so how do we make sure that we're not doing that, I think is the question. Thanks, Dennis. Um, you know, I think it, a great question. And it really, first, it goes back to your mission and your vision. So revisiting those to say, you know, is this who we are and who we should be right now? And once you have those clarified and um, com you're committed to, then um, I think the other tool that is really valuable, and so that you're going through the exercise and really going through the whole um, real-time strategic planning cycle, so looking at your current business model, really making that distinction between who we serve, who we don't serve, where our funding is. There's a great uh, worksheet that we use that lo looks at each of your individual programs and identify those that um, support themselves that are revenue neutral or those that, that um, are running deficits to help you kind of look at the financial impact of each of those, uh, your programs. And then the strategy screen is the key tool to really help you be disciplined in making decisions about your future direction. And holding true to that strategy screen can really help you if you're a dreamer or you like to think big to, uh, to have a framework to make those decisions. Great. Thanks, Mary. Some other questions that, um, let's see here. Uh, can you suggest some resources for dashboards? We're just getting started with this. Love to have some direction. I'm going to turn that one over to Ben because he's our in-house uh, dashboard expert. Yes, you know, there are several great resources. Um, one is the Center for What Works. It provides some great examples of both logic models and dashboards. The UW Extension is another resource that has some great tools. Um, I can follow up with, with this individual specifically. We've also created our own uh, dashboard template that's really usable, and, and, and it will send that over. It's a great way, 
uh, one person just brought up the question, what is a dashboard? So I should start there. A dashboard is a concise, typically it's a one-page document that can provide information about your organization's mission, its goals, its programs, as well as your finances. And so if you imagine, it's often used at a, at a board meeting. So instead of looking through 40 pages of board notes, it would be like a cover page that could provide some high-level metrics and details about the progress of the organization. We found it's a great communication tool and really helps with board engagement. It also helps with funders that often wonder, how are we doing? It's a great way to communicate and demonstrate the, the types of impact that you're having by showing the strategic goals that you're reaching and how you're measuring it. So we'll provide some resources and links to where you can find that information in the follow-up. One person, and this is a great question for you, Mary, is asking how do we collaborate and compete at the same time? I think this is a trend that we've seen quite a bit, that the, the, the organizations that we work with are often also the ones that we compete with in other senses. Mm -hmm. Well, you, uh, my, my guess is you're living that experience right now. I mean, examples of that certainly you know, could be uh, organizations that may be on coordinating councils or such that come together to mobilize for um, advocacy purposes so that you all have a common mission um, and that you're able to leverage your, um, your collective resources to have a greater impact protect potentially in the in the advocacy arena yet you are also competing with each other for potentially the same um, staff or for funding and I think that's sort of the nature of our business in the sense of being in the nonprofit sector that we do compete and collaborate fairly often and you know what what allows for that to be to be successful is the fact that we uh, build uh, relationships and so that we're, we understand that we at times have to work together and at other times we may be on opposite sides of, of a situation. So I hope I answered for that question. Great. Thank you, Mary. I think we have time for one more question. For all those that have questions that haven't been answered, please follow up with us afterwards. We're more than happy to discuss. This is a good question for you, Dennis, about I think board in, in engagement and roles and how to discern whether someone should be invited on the board, should they be playing in a different role, how do they fit with the mission, and, and kind of that orientation question. Great. Thanks, Ben. And a, and a great question. I actually was just uh, with some board source uh, you know, facilitator trainers the, the week before last, and I think this one really comes down to roles and responsibilities and making sure that there's clear understanding of what the board is expected to do and what the staff is doing and what that, that relationship looks like. But uh, again, I don't want to read into the question, but you know, it's really trying to understand when someone should be invited on the board. And I think you know, some of the national trends that we're seeing, and we heard from Emily Hall at uh, Olive Grove Consulting last month on our board governance and some of those shifting governance models, is that boards are really, um, in many cases, are getting smaller to be more effective. And I also think so. Uh, in that context, not only is it are they getting smaller to be more uh, effective, but it's also about are you getting the right people board? So the question here is, you know, you know, or is it to be that team player helping to implement the mission of the organization versus being on the board? And board members wear different hats. Um, perhaps maybe they could be uh, a board member in addition to also uh, a volunteer or in some other capacity that they're helping to implement that mission. But um, I would say, you know, I think the last part of the question is where it does or should this overlap, if at all. Um, there definitely is overlap because you want people who are really engaged in your mission and can help um, support you and your organization. But a board's member role is, um, you know, it can also be different than perhaps that volunteer's role. So, um, and we're going to have some additional resources available on, on board governance as well. Mary, I don't know if you want to add anything. I think you know, um, just I would just say one thing that you know not everybody is best suited to be a board member, and as you as you touched on it, Dennis, that maybe um, you know the first step with an individual is for them to uh, volunteer with the organization and see what they can offer and how engaged or how interested they are. Yep. So that could be the use of committees or task forces or some other structures. Special project, get. particular, yep. if you have something, absolutely. You don't have to be a board member to be on a committee or a task force either. OK. Well, I think we're almost out of time, so we're going to turn it back to Tom. But again, as Ben mentioned, if you have any questions that we didn't get answered, um, we certainly would get those um, responded to you. And um, we're happy to support in any way we can. 
Thank you, Dennis. Uh, please join me in thanking Dennis, Mary, and Ben for today's content and BMO Harris Bank for their support. The strategy presentation they shared was so valuable, and with all of our webinars, the recording will be available for playback from our website. I would encourage all participants to review our website at forwardci.org for more information on how FCI might help your organization. One last note, when you close your browser from this session, you will be directed to a very concise questionnaire to evaluate today's webinar. Please take a few minutes to complete or, uh, to complete to help us continue to improve the effectiveness of these offerings. Thanks. Thank you very much and enjoy your day. Thank you, Tom. And when one last note, just for those that are on the line, on our website you'll also be able to register for upcoming webinars next month on Tuesday, July 16th from noon to 1. We'll be having a webinar on social innovation and entrepreneurship and how that fits with nonprofit organizations. Thank you all again. Thanks for joining us. The organizer has